Formula E Season 6 has finally drawn to a close after six races in nine days. One of the most surreal motorsports events I think I have ever witnessed, the world has ever witnessed, and certainly Formula E has ever witnessed, and that's certainly saying something with some of the carnage we've seen over the past six seasons in Formula E. And in today's video, I didn't really get a chance to really sink my teeth into those six races in Berlin, thanks to the nature of there being two pretty much every other day. It was crazy hectic, partner that, that it was in between the British Grand Prix, the 70th anniversary of Grand Prix and Spanish Grand Prix. I didn't really get to talk about the season finale as much as I would have liked. And there were so many stories up and down the grid, driver transfers. We've even got some of more of that today. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking over the season, having a look back at some of those early races, thinking about our predictions that we made at the beginning of the year and having a quick look forward to next season. And this will be in a similar kind of style to the last couple of Formula E videos, more of a podcast, laid back, chilled style vibe rather than a, a super serious, super pinpoint accurate style of video that we usually do with the Formula One content. And I did say over the last couple of Formula E styles as well, that for season seven, I'm going to do a big, big revamp. Already started working on some of that. Trying to trial a few different things with F1 first before we then move it over to Formula E. But I think we've got some really awesome things in the pipeline. So this will be a very, very different video if you are new to what you'll see for season seven. But I think first things first we got to talk about those final two races in Berlin. I never did a race review for either of the two races. And actually, for Formula E standards, I expected going to a technically a new circuit, the traditional Berlin layout, but with an extended final sector. I thought we might see a bit of jockeying for position at the front, but we had two very dominant races. Two races that were won by two first-time winners, Ollie Rowland and Stoffel van Dorn. Both of them made their debuts last season. Rowland for the Nissan team, van Dorn for HWA. I thought Rowland would have a strong season this year. In my predictions, I did put him to finish eighth overall, one in front of teammate Sebastian Buemi. And he started off so strong, he was consistent all year long and to finally get that first win after getting three pole positions, two last year, one on the day of his win, really coming of age Ollie Rowland, a driver I felt a couple of years back was so unlucky not to get an opportunity in Formula One, he never quite had that real backing to get a space on the grid, had a trial run as a Williams reserve driver and test driver but again that was never a situation where Williams could really afford to put Roland in a seat. So moving to Nissan at such short notice, don't forget it was Alex Albon who was supposed to be driving for Nissan last year until he was called up to Toro Rosso Quickly, they needed a replacement. And Roland, not only has been a super sub, is now really starting to challenge Sebastian Buemi for that number one status. And don't forget, Buemi still has the most wins of any Formula E driver. He is a Formula E legend and champion. So Roland really is progressing really, really nicely over these last couple of seasons. And to get that win in the final, what we want to technically call weekend, that is huge for Ollie, and I really can't wait to see what he does next year. And then, of course, on our final day of the season, something we're so, so used to in Formula One, a Mercedes 1-2. Finally, the brand new team for this season, if you don't want to count HWA from last year, but Mercedes on top. Their first win in the history. Not only was it their first win, it was Stoffel van Dorn's first win in Formula E. Not his first podium. He did manage to nick a third place last year in Rome. Also got a pole position last year in Hong Kong in wet conditions. But his first pole, his first win for Mercedes. And alongside him on that second step, Nick de Vries. His first for Mercedes. His first in Formula E. And I think... When we showed up to Berlin, De Vries was one of those drivers that was quite far behind in the standings. Outside that top 10, Van Dorn comfortably looking the better of the two. But De Vries, I think if I'm going to 
pick a couple of drivers that really impressed me in those last six races. Nick was certainly one of them. Two fourth places, a second place in there as well, and a DNF in that second race. He was also comfortably in that top five. Did a cracking job, did Nick DeVries, and it's another driver that I think will take all the learnings that he'd done over the course of season six and come back even stronger in season seven. And of course, with those final two races complete, we now have our final standings. And we knew De Costa, who has been easily the most consistent driver this year. We knew he was going to be good. We knew he was going to be comfortably in that championship lead. But when you look at the rest of the field... I think it really does paint the picture, not only how good Da Costa is, but just how unpredictable Formula E is. And if Da Costa wasn't in the field, we would have had a championship won by one point. Third place, Sebastian Buemi, it would have been, would have lost out by three points. Fourth place, Roland, would have lost out by four points. Crazy stuff how tight it was at that second kind of tier behind Antonio Felix da Costa. But again, I think, and I don't want to reiterate this because I did a whole video talking about how good da Costa's season is, but the way he showed up to Berlin, already leading the standings, the driver with the most to lose, with the most pressure on his shoulders, the way he reacted to that, the way he differed to his other championship rivals, a lot of whom really slipped back massively in the standings. I think really does just cement how good of a season this was. And really, maybe Sebastian Buemi season two would rival this, but one of the most dominant seasons we have ever seen in Formula E. And considering that he came to this team, the team that he technically was with in those first two seasons when they were known as Amelie Naguri, He's now back. He's alongside Vern. It's Vern's team. It was a risk to leave BMW and the imprint he's left. Not on this team, but the sport in general. First non-F1 driver to win the standings. A real cracking season from De Costa. But before we get into the rest of the standings, I think I do need to just thank Formula E for this incredible event. Formula One, we know really struggled to put on events and they still are. They're looking to get a 17 race calendar is what we're aiming for and there's an announcement we're guessing in the next couple of days regarding the rest of the calendar. However, they have really struggled to set up races in North America, in Asia, which is totally understandable with everything going on. But Formula E, rather than trying to really squish in this calendar, try and get races here, there and everywhere... I love the fact that they always just try and do the quirkiest of things that usually you'd expect a lot of drivers not to be happy with and not a lot of fans to be happy with. And doing six races at one venue, you can understand why fans initially were a little bit sceptical. But doing the two race format was really, really fun. It was endless. It was great seeing so many different winners, so many different contenders every time out. And just doing those slight different variations, the reverse layout, I thought that was really, really fun. The extended layout, and yes, Formula E's got a little bit more freedom to do that, but to put on an event in relatively short amount of time, as such a successful event, thank you so much to Formula E. I'm just disappointed it's over, to be totally honest with you, and it is very surreal that we went so, so long without a race, and now, within a couple of weeks, it's all over, and we're finding ourselves looking forward to Season 7, where already we have seen so, so many changes. It is a really, really strange situation to be in, but I did want to do this. A couple of weeks ago, someone had mentioned doing a predictions video, having a reaction to my predictions. And I was thinking, oh, where can I do that? Because if I do that as a separate video, it won't be particularly long. Can I squidge it in somewhere? I thought, you know what? If we have this little chat at the end of the season, I can throw it in there. And I think the best way of doing it is literally going through the standings, the official standings, and then having a look at where I place the driver. It's not great. I really did mess up some of these. And of course, with everything that went on this year, it is so, so tricky to play some of these drivers. I mean, even Daniel Apt, for example, joining Neo. I don't think many of us were seeing that at the beginning of the year. Verline leaving halfway through. Just very, very difficult to predict. Porsche and Mercedes, I didn't expect them to be as good as they were. But something I did predict, which... <laughs> 
I kind of hate to say, was Ma finishing at the bottom. Well, technically, he didn't actually. In P28, yeah, 28 drivers contested in Formula E this year. Sergio Sete Camera, a driver I didn't expect to join the championship this year, of course, is the reserve driver for Alpha Tauri and Red Bull. Big surprise when we showed up to Berlin. And he'd replaced Brendan Hartley. Hartley, I didn't expect to leave out of the two, though I think Muller is a strong, strong driver. I just, I was very, very surprised to see Camera, who may potentially get a shot at an F1 drive, move to Formula E. How did he do in those races? Not great. I think when you look at some of the other substitutes, he was probably at the bottom tier of that group. But a lot of the other substitutes, Tom Blomquist, uh, Alex Lynn, they already had Formula E experience. So for Tete Camera, there were some impressive drives in there. There are a lot of rookie mistakes. But if he does get that drive next season, I think he is certainly a driver to watch out for. Blomquist finished one place ahead, P27. He was very impressive in the two races he did. Will he get a drive next year? I think it's unlikely. He had a stint with Neo a couple of years ago, I think alongside Oliver Turvey, and was trading that seat with Mar. But a good couple of races for Jaguar, no points, but I think has done his reputation quite good by that single race return. Mar, obviously, P26, also no points. Nico Muller, no points for J Ox Dragon. Raced in every single E Prix, was having a really good race in Mexico, but finishing the season, no points. Oliver Turvey, you just feel for the man. Also, the final driver in 24th place to not pick up a single point. He's just got so much talent, and you really do feel he's being wasted. However, there has been a few transfers today. There are seats opening up further up the grid. I hope Turvey is considered by some of those big names. A BMW seat available this morning as well. If he could get the move there, I think he could really be a big contender for next season. Thoroughly deserves a shot at points. Comfortably that best driver in that back pack. P23, Brendan Hartley, the only driver to pick up points for Dragon. And that was way back in the second race of the season. I'm not quite sure why. He decided to leave or why the team didn't want to continue racing with him. I don't know if it was to do with the fact he was based in New Zealand and the race was in Germany and it was difficult getting him over. I haven't really seen much information about that. But if you do know, feel free to throw it in the comment section down below. But not a superstar couple of races for Brendan. But is that to be expected in the Dragon Car? The only driver in that team to pick up points and a backmarker team. Felipe Massa. P22, a disappointing season. I did put him 19th in my standings, which isn't a million miles away. I thought Edo Mortara would have a better season building off that win he got last year in Hong Kong, and he did. Mortara finishing 14th, had a really strong start to the year. Felipe, though, three points, only one point in those six races in Berlin, and has officially renounced that he will be retiring from Formula E, leaving Venturi at the end of the season. And I think it was just nice to see Felipe have a couple of seasons, give it a go, got that podium in Monaco, of course, and we all wish him the best for the future. But another seat available, a strong seat, not well beaters, but in that midfield, Mercedes powertrain, not bad at all. Daniel Apt, P21. I put him 11th, but of course, I don't think any of us would have expected to happen what happens. It'd been over that break, that virtual E pre racing they would do, the racing at home, that was it, wasn't it? Moving to Neo, scoring no points in Berlin, an event and a track, a circuit where he's usually really, really good, so that would have hurt him even more. What is there to say? If he stays at Neo, Neo have got a really strong driver there and Daniel Att with plenty of experience. But he is another driver that I think BMW should consider, Venturi should consider. And he's a driver that warrants a better seat on the grid. Mahindra as well, I think there's a seat still available there. There's seats all over the place, but Daniel Att I think warrants a better drive. He doesn't deserve to be in that Neo. But he tied points with Neil Jarney, P20 for Neil Jarney. I put him in P22 in my predictions. Again, not a million miles off. But scored in that final two races, eight points in round 10. 
A really great drive, actually, in those final two races. I think he was helped by the fact that extended circuit helped the final group in qualifying. And that really did play into his hands and quite a few other drivers' hands during those final two rounds. But to score some points, to leave the team on a high, of course, being replaced by Pascal Verlein. Now that transfer's been announced and this cascade of other transfers is coming into play. There will be a transfer talk maybe next week. I haven't quite decided to pin a date on it, but Formula One transfer talk this weekend. So we might do a Formula E1 during the week in the build-up to the next Formula One Grand Prix. James Collado, another driver. I was unsure how he'd perform this year. Finished 19th. I predicted 21st. 10 points. An okay job. Didn't do the final two races. I think we all expected coming into this year, it was a strange decision to Firstly, get rid of Alex Lynn and to bring in James Collado. They gave him a chance. Difficult season, though, for the British driver. Then it's the three Mahindra boys. D'Ambrosio scoring the most points with 19 in 16th place. Alex Lynn in 17th place on 16 points. And Pascal Verlein 18th place on 14 points. So considering Lynn and Verlein, Verlein did five races, Lynn did six. They're very, very close in terms of points. D'Ambrosio, who did all 11, 19 points, he's leaving the team, we found out this morning, being replaced by Alex Sims. That was a big surprise. I didn't see that one coming. Will D'Ambrosio stay in Formula E? I kind of hope he does because he is one of those four original drivers that took place and have taken place in every single Formula E event. Will Neo take him? Will a team like Venturi take him? I think it's possible. He's got a couple of wins under his belt in Formula E, but not his best season. Pascal Verlein, though, well, I predicted him to be fourth. So 18th. Yes, again, I didn't expect him to not take part in half the races, but not my best prediction, though D'Ambrosio finished 16th. I said 15th, so I'll certainly take that one. One of the surprise Real big surprise replacement that did really, really well. Rene Rast, Aldi, 15th place. Yes, he only scored, well, he scored, I think, in that first race in Berlin, in round six, got one point, and then got a podium finish on round 10, the second to last race, and then a fourth place in the final race. Really, really turned out to be a really strong driver for Audi. Contesting with Degrassi, not falling back during the races. No rookie mistakes. We know he's got plenty of experience in motor racing. And we know he's quick. He's great in DTM. A DTM champion. I want to say WEC champion, but I might be slightly off there. Anyway, he's done bits in Formula E. First real taste of single seats rating for a long, long time. I'd be very surprised with Audi leaving DTM if he didn't get that seat next year. Really, really good start from Rene Rast. Edo Mortara, we spoke about him a little bit earlier on with Felipe Massa, but Massa on three points, Mortara on 41. Edo, what a season he ended up having. I predicted him to be 17th, finished 14th, so not a million miles away, but I didn't expect the gap to Massa to be that big. He's a driver that can take that team forward. There are a team that are in that midfield. No podium this year for Venturi, but a real strong start to the season. Not so great at the end and did tail off in Berlin. But Mortara, a driver that I questioned a couple of years ago, why Venturi chose to keep him over Mauro Engel, has really done the team justice last year in particular, but I think this year even more so potentially with Massa struggling. Alex Sims, 13th place, 49 points for the British driver, was part of that group. Sims, 40, uh, 13th, sorry. Max Gunter, 9th. Mitch Evans, 7th. All of these guys were the closest to taking down the Costa in the standings. What happened? Really, what happened? They just completely fell off the cliff. Really struggled with group qualifying. I think Mitch Evans was the biggest hit by that. Gunter, of course, got that win in round eight, I think it was, that third, fourth race of the Berlin series. However, his season is so up and down. He scored points on three occasions over the course of the entire season. Two of those are wins. One of those were the second place. He didn't score at any other point. What a strange season for Max Gunter. I put him all the way up in second place. 
in my standings, in my predictions. Finishing ninth, yeah, I was a little bit off. But as I said earlier, Max Gunter is just 17 points off second place in the standings. I mean, God, it's so, so close how the Formula E season ended. Mitch Evans, of course, who was second, finishing seventh, consistently just qualifying way outside the top 15, fighting back for points, but he really just needed to have one or two qualifiers where he just absolutely smashed it. And what was looking like a real championship challenging season for Jaguar, their first, never really amounted to anything really. Robin Frines, P12, Sam Bird, P10, those two really, really close in what was their final season as teammates at Virgin. Robin, who we expect to stay with the Virgin team. Sam Bird, of course, leaving for Jaguar next year. Had an awesome Kylo Ren helmet. Had a podium in that first of those Berlin races. Also had a great final race with the team. A fifth place in the final race of the season. Nick De Vries was in between the two of them. A really, really strong rookie season for Nick De Vries. I mean, do we say he's the rookie of the year? Because technically, this was Max Gunter's first full rookie season but I don't know I'm not too sure quite how we stand on that one so I would say Nick DeVries was rookie of the season because Gunter I think did over half the races last year for the Dragon team but DeVries after a tricky start I said it earlier much much better in Berlin Stoffel van Dorm his teammate second overall what a difference a year makes HWA last year Brand new team. I predicted them to be 13th and 14th, Van Dorn and De Vries. So they really surprised me this year, did Mercedes. And fair play to them. Really, really bouncing back strong. Other drivers in that top 10. We, we mentioned Gunter. Um, Andre Lotterer for Porsche. Eighth overall, joint with Mitch Evans. He was only 16 points off second in the standings. Fair play to Lotra. Has really taken that team by the scruff of the neck with his teammate on eight points. Comfortably that team leader. Of course, Verline coming in next year. That's going to be a spicy one to keep your eye on between Lotra and Verline. But another step up for the team. Who will be that team leader? I'm not too sure. I think Lotra with that year under his belt with technically a, a, it's kind of a season or a couple of seasons really worth of extra Formula E experience thanks to Verline just missing so many races over his two seasons it's quite strange actually I think Lotterer will be the favourite to be the better of the two but I think Verline hasn't ever really had that consistency to be able to show his true potential Degrassi sixth it's kind of what we expect second of overall last year wasn't a million miles away of second this year, 10 points, but it was so, so close. If he'd have nicked that podium instead of his teammate late on, he would have finished second. But another strong year from Degrassi. Continues to be one of the most consistent guys in Formula E, but beat by both Nissans. But when we just on the final day of the season, beating Ollie Rowland fourth and fifth, a team going from strength to strength, really trying to reinvigorate themselves back to those Renault Edams days. The Nissan Edams, they changed their team principal. It's no longer Michael Carcamo. I, I'm not quite sure. I'm sorry. Apologies of the, the new team principal name. That's one I'm going to have to learn for next season. But he came in for Berlin, wasn't allowed to attend the event. All a little bit strange, but obviously Roland picking up that win, a couple of podiums from Sebastian Buemi as well. A team that I really do think had a great car last year. Another great car this year, comfortably off to Costa, but Roland, again, another season under his belt. He's going to go from strength to strength. And that top three, of course, we spoke about to Costa. His teammate was third, John Eric Verne. He did a really good recovery race pretty much all the way through in Berlin. One win this season, though, which was in round nine of 11. That was a big surprise. Our reigning double champion, comfortably beaten by his teammate, will be disappointed this year. I'm sure we'll come back stronger next year. But to be beat by Stoffel van Dorn, I don't think many people would have said that at the start of last year. Van Dorn, one of the drivers of the season. 
in a car which wasn't a top car. It's not a Tachita. It's not a Nissan. It's not a Jaguar. Not an Audi. I'd put that Mercedes car behind all of those, even perhaps behind the Virgin and the Porsche. The consistency he was able to have, especially with those back-to-back -back podiums in those first two races, several fifth places, that win, of course, in that final race of the season, just to top it off, the perfect end, just beating that double champion, Vern, by one point. Can he take this fight to Tachita, to Da Costa, to Vern next season? That's something I'm really, really looking forward to. We've been going for quite some time. I didn't realise we're at 25 minutes. Goodness me. Right. Plan of action from here. We've got a transfer talk in the next couple of weeks. It's on its way. So many transfers at the moment. I'm kind of just letting the playing field just settle down a little bit. But I think at the moment we've got a nice amount of seats available. A nice amount of confirmed transfers that we can have a good gas bag about. For next year though, it's going to be carnage. It's going to be even more unpredictable. Fingers crossed we get back to a normal calendar or normal-ish calendar. And don't worry, if you do enjoy Formula E... Though we've got about a, well, I was going to say six month wait. We're, we're pretty much almost, we're almost September. It's not a six month wait at all. It's three or four months until Chile. We will be continuing to do Formula E content here. Do not worry. Again, I'm hoping to take it up another level next year, like we've done for the last couple of seasons since season four, getting better and better and better. And I've re I'm, I'm really excited for next year, guys. And pretty much content, or at least, talking about next season starts tomorrow weekly mailbox four o'clock be there <laughs> anyway guys we'll leave that there for another season of formula e i might do a more structured version of a season review like we did last year with the highlights i'll get on on the old emails with some of the formula e boys and girls about that but if not i've absolutely loved season six of formula e it's been up it, it's been down it's always something i'm criticized for for having on the channel but i love it it will never change. And to those of you that are still here at this point in the video, I want to thank you guys in particular for sticking with it. It will never change. It will always be here on the channel. And again, hopefully we can take it all the, up to that next level next season. So if you are new around here and you've made it this far, feel free to subscribe. If you've made it this far, why haven't you clicked that red button already? If you did enjoy, hit that like button. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed Formula E Season 6. I hope you enjoyed the content on this channel over this crazy year. Thanks guys for watching and I hope to see you all in the next one.